Every landscape has a story, an origin story of how the land came to be. Figuring out nature's riddles, how it might have created a mountain, a canyon, a shoreline, has always intrigued me. For 35 years, the towering walls of Stawamas Chief Mountain, just up Howe Sound from my home on Bowen Island, have puzzled me. What forces created this great mass of barren stone? The stunning granite walls of Suwamish Chief Mountain rise high above the town of Squamish, BC, just northwest of the city of Vancouver. Thousands pass below its towering cliffs every day on the highway between Vancouver and the mountain resort town of Whistler. Its great walls are the heart of what makes Squamish the greatest rock climbing center in Canada, and its granite dome summits provide stunning views of the glacier car fjord of Atkatsum House Sound and the mountains that surround it. For the Skohomish peoples who have lived in the shadow of the chief for millennia, the mountain is Siam Smanite, meaning revered one. In the creation story of the Skohomish, Siam Smanite is a longhouse turned to stone by the mythic Transformer Brothers. And to this day, the Skohomish search the mountain for the faces of those trapped inside. On a rainforest coast where vegetation blankets everything from shoreline to alpine, the chief's vast expanses of bare rock beg explanation. Recently, I've come to believe that three elements have come together to create the chief. Granite, cracks, and glaciers. Let's start with the first, granite. The chief is made of granodirite, a member of the granitic rock family, but for simplicity's sake, I use the term granite to refer to the whole family of granitic rocks that form from molten rock deep in the earth. To hold up the chief's great walls over the millennia, its rock must be hard and durable. Granite is just such a rock. Granite's composed of the hard minerals feldspar and quartz, with a scattering of dark amphibole and mica that give granite a salt and pepper appearance. Granite's durable because its mineral grains interlock. They grew together as melted rock cooled and crystallized. Granite, like the Chiefs, is forming today deep below the volcanoes of the Pacific Northwest, as the North American tectonic plate that we live on collides with the tectonic plate underlying the nearby Pacific Ocean. The descending ocean plate causes melting, and this magma rises, either to the Earth's surface to erupt as a volcano, or to cool and crystallize at depth into a mass of granite. Ancient collision zones have produced granites along the coast of BC for the past 150 million years. This has made the Coast Mountains granite country. From Alaska to Vancouver. When we wander among the granite peaks of the Coast Mountains, we wander among ancient magma chambers, the excavated molten birthplaces of granite. The chief is but one formed deep in the earth and brought slowly to surface over millions of years by rising mountains combined with eroding mountain tops. However, I know that granite alone can't explain the chief's steep sides and barren summits. Most mountains between Vancouver and Whistler are made of granite, but they don't look like the chief. Other geological factors must be at play. And what I've learned is that there's a second factor, cracks. Cracks, planes of weakness, cut through the chief mountain. 
It is the presence of these cracks that has created the shape of the chief. The chief is a ridge, almost two kilometers long, but only half a kilometer wide. Viewed from the side as we typically do, it's a long series of vertical walls. But if the chief ridge is viewed end on, it looks completely different. And that's what I'm doing today, something I've never done before having a good look at its north end. I'm immediately struck by how narrow the chief ridge is. Deep gullies form two shadowed vertical slashes in the mountain. And the sunlit rock walls show a vertical striping like the grain in wood. Steeply inclined cracks, closely spaced, cut into the mountain from top to bottom. Intrigued, I pull out a satellite image of the chief, a view from above. The top of the mountain has a striped pattern, parallel to the length of the ridge. Some stripes are cracks in rock. Others are narrow vegetated gullies crossing the bedrock, likely eroded along cracks. These cracks run the entire length of the chief ridge and must be the same cracks exposed on the north end of the chief. Wow, that's a wild thought. Cracks or planes of weakness cut through the whole mountain something like a loaf of sliced bread that's been frozen, with the slices held together by the freezing. And this gets me thinking. These northeast trending cracks in the chief are parallel to others around northern Howe Sound, and suggest they formed from tectonic forces deep in the earth. As the granite emerged at the surface, cracks formed as the weight of overlying rock was removed. The next day, I'm heading up the Chief. I'm really curious to see the cracks up close. And they aren't hard to find. Some are right on the trail. Others right at a summit. In some cases, the cracks create a route for the trail. Small gullies are obvious too, formed where the top of a crack is widened, allowing soil to accumulate and plants to grow. And then I come to the giant gullies that I saw yesterday, cutting the north end of the chief. Their great size must reflect erosion down into a wide zone of cracks. Back at the parking lot, I stare up at the chief's great walls. Now I see them in a different light. The walls are an exposed surface of several closely spaced cracks along which the rock is broken away. I head south along the highway a short way. From here, I'm reminded of something I think of every time I see the chief from this view. Part of the mountain is missing. I head to the base of the chief's big walls. There are boulders all through the forest that tell of ongoing collapse over the centuries and several recent rock falls remind us this collapse continues. But I'm still puzzled. The amount of rubble below the walls doesn't account for all the missing mass of the mountain. Part of the mountain is gone. Which leads me to what I believe is the third crucial factor that created the chief monolith, Ice Age glaciers. For about two and a half million years, and ending only about 12,000 years ago, vast ice sheets expanded and then melted back, expanded and melted back, at times covering most of Canada. In the Squamish area, the glaciers were as much as two kilometers thick in the major valleys. Only the highest peaks stood above the ice. And today, the height of those ancient glaciers is reflected in the shape of our mountains. Our highest peaks are craggy, mid-elevation peaks are somewhat rounded, and lower hills are more rounded. This reflects the height of Ice Age glaciers that smoothed and scoured. The thicker the flowing ice above a surface, the greater the smoothing and rounding. The legacy of Ice Age glaciers lives on in the shape of our mountains. At the Chief, Ice Age scour was particularly intense. 
spectacular whalebacks are carved into granite at the base of the chief by Highway 99. Nearby, dramatic scratches indicate the ancient glacier flowed down the Howe Sound Valley. Of course, ice alone can't carve rock, but stone, sand, and fine rock flour stuck to the base of a two-kilometer thick glacier can deeply scour, scratch, and polish. Glacial sculpting has rounded the summits of the chief, over 600 meters above the highway, leaving them polished and scratched. These dramatic features make me wonder whether the chief's location contributed to this intense glacial sculpting. After all, it sits in a narrow gap through a mountain wall. This gap must have had great significance during the Ice Age, because vast glaciers in the coast mountains flowing seaward had to converge through this gap. Squeezed this way, glacier flow speeds up just as a river accelerates through a narrows as rapids. The scouring power of such fast-moving ice would be huge, particularly given that the chief was overrun by more than a kilometer of glacier ice. Glaciers erode both by the sandpapering action of abrasion and by plucking. The wedging open of rock fractures in bedrock and the breaking off of fragments the fast-flowing glaciers would have had the power to exploit the planes of weakness in the chief mountain, breaking off rock slice after rock slice, carrying them away, and leaving the mountain with its great walls. And there you have it. That's my best guess as to how the great stone mass of Stawamish chief came to be. What I've learned is that the glaciers pulled it all together. It started with hard granite, and that granite contained a closely spaced set of cracks that was then sculpted by fast flowing glacier ice forced through a narrow gap in a mountain wall. When the glaciers melted back, the great stone mass of the chief was revealed. Stawamas Chief, Siam Smanite, is an icon of the Sea to Sky region. Unique forces over millions of years created this extraordinary landscape with its extraordinary presence. And it reminds us that is what nature can do.